Thank you very much indeed, everybody, for staying around this afternoon to listen to what I think is going to be one of the most exciting debates of Davos. I would say that I'm moderating it. We are talking about transforming food systems and land use. This is the Western Hemisphere version of a debate that's been going on all day. I just wanted to go into a, a little bit of housekeeping, if I can, before I get to what is a phenomenal cast of speakers uh, and panelists. Just a little bit of housekeeping. This session will be live cast on the forum website. Uh, you can follow it on the web, uh, social media accounts, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram. And we will also post this chat uh, for top link attendees also. Right, I'm going to let everybody into a little secret. By the way, my name is Steve Sedgwick. I'm an anchor over at CNBC. My moderator's notes for this panel, very important panel, said one of the things we want to do is inject a sense of urgency into the debate about food systems and land use from all stakeholders, one speaking and watching. The truth is, though, of course, this topic needs, needs no ramping up of the sense of urgency. We all appreciate the sense of urgency. Every single one of this amazing panel, uh, it is very clear that now is the time for actions, not words. Uh, and as you're all aware, the importance of this panel is underlined by the mountain of, of terrifying statistics around the importance of a transformation of our food systems. So I thought I'd just start off very quickly. I've got about a minute to talk and then I'm going to get to our brilliant panel. Uh, what is a food system? Some people might just think it's about agricultural production. Yes, it is. But it's about the processing, the transportation, uh, and of course, the consumption. The consumption is absolutely key. I saw a, a fantastic quote uh, about food systems. It's not something we can program, we can get an algorithm for. It, it is, and the quote I'm stealing here says it is about billions of people making millions of decisions that none of us can control and I thought that was a very important point uh, about uh, what the food system represents it's a lot of constituents a lot of stakeholders all of us uh, as we stand some of the devastating statistics nearly two billion people in the world do not have access to safe nutritious and sufficient food we're gonna have 10 billion people on the planet by 2050 so this problem could could if we don't have action get even worse as well and of course COVID-19 has made this even more pressing issue. We got away with it in many ways because we had some good harvest coming into COVID-19, uh, but so many parts of the global population spend so much of their money, perhaps 80% in some cases, of their income on food. So it's so important there. Biodiversity too, and nearly 1 million species at risk of extinction. And if we change our food systems, maybe we can do something very important about that as well. Uh, and one more statistic, which I think is a stain on, on the population, possibly the West suspect especially 1 billion tons of food. 1 billion tons of food. I can't even comprehend that. Are thrown away every year, are wasted every year. But the good news is my other brief was not just about urgency. It was about opportunity. And this is where this brilliant panel comes in as well, because with the systems, Food Systems Summit 2021, uh, we've got a whole host of opportunities here to really make some progress this year, next year, and all the way up to 2030 as well. So let me just tell you what this brilliant, brilliant panel is that we've got here today. Uh, and ahead of that, we're going to have a brilliant speaker as well. I'll come to her in a few moments time. So we have in no particular order, His Excellency Carlos uh, Alvarado, Quesada, who is, I'm sure you're aware, uh, the president uh, of Costa Rica. So, sir, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Uh, Chu Dong Yu is the director general of the UN Food and Agricultural Organization. Viva Draya is the chairman of the managing board of Rabobank Group. Ramon Laguata is the chairman and chief executive uh, of PepsiCo Inc. And Agnes Calibata is the special envoy for the UN Food Systems Summit, which I, I may have already mentioned as well. So I'm very excited about Agnes, your contribution today as well. Look, before we get to our debate as well, uh, we have a very special speaker, a very busy lady, if I may say. She's literally just rushed from one panel to another as well. But I'm delighted to welcome Her Excellency Amina Mohammed, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the UN of the United Nations, who will now make some opening remarks. Over to you. Thank you very much and for the energy that you brought into the room and there's only one excellency and that's our president of Costa Rica. Rest uh, colleagues and friends really pleased to be with you today at the start of this really pivotal year when we must heal from the impacts of the COVID crisis and get ourselves back on track uh, for a world that's cleaner, it's safer, it's fairer for all. But I think just as you said that we need to bring urgency to the action and it needs to be at scale. The pandemic, of course, is taking a terrible toll on lives and livelihoods and against the backdrop of the climate crisis, again, increasing in th uh, threats to biodiversity and other challenges on our planetary health. So we do need to move to a phase of healing people and the planet so that we come out of this on the right side of history. The blueprint for recovery already exists. The Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development are in place. 
food and land systems are going to be key to ending poverty and hunger, but also to ensuring we've got good health and well-being, there are decent livelihoods, gender equality, of course the climate action we need to take, and this does bring about stability, so therefore peace. And we must know that um, it is only on strong institutions will we be able to deliver the scale and the sustainability of our investments and actions. It's the background to the Secretary General's decision to convene the first ever Food Systems Summit later this year. And as you said, it's about billions of decisions that people take every year. But how do we make it fairer? How is there more equity in this? And how does this become good, not just for people, but for the environment that we live in? So friends and colleagues, we, we do know that fat food and land are the core components of our cultures and our economies and access to food is a human right. Let's underscore that and remember it. But last year, sadly, 690 million people were undernourished and over 3 billion couldn't afford a healthy diet. So there's a real risk of famine in several countries, even in the wealthiest, and there are growing numbers of food insecure people. And we've seen this in the impact of COVID. Our global food system is a $10 trillion economy, and it is connecting 7.5 billion consumers and a diverse array of over, over a billion food producers. And that all uses half of our habitable land on Earth. And one third of that, sadly, as we're hearing in recent weeks, is degraded, um, threatening the sustainability of our sector and the chances of really feeding everyone with a nutritious diet. So where should we start to look for the solutions? And just allow me to proffer three very quick ones. First, needing to ensure that food and land use sectors are properly funded with long-term incentives that reward the supply of nutritious and affordable food. And this then brings in our indigenous farmers, our women, and really is an inclusive way of tackling um, inequality. Uh, the international community will need to ensure strong capital and technology flows to developing countries so that they can strengthen food systems while building prosperity and accessing, accessing global markets. And it's really important here that we don't see the digital divide um, in, increase um, in many of our developing countries. Second, we do need to do more to recognize and, and uh, protect our natural capital. And by way of example, I welcome the high ambition coalition that's championed by Costa Rica in collaboration with France and the UK, which seeks to protect or effectively conserve at least 30% of the planet by 2030. Ambitious, but well needed now. Third, we need innovative policies, including regulatory reforms, taxation, um, accountability measures around land um, and food. These should encourage better behaviors from production to consumption and support a much more sustainable relationship between um, people and the land. These policies got to recognize the enormous diversity in agriculture. Most of them 600 million farms in the world are still owned and run by families and, and indigenous people. At the same time, only 1% of farms operate more than 70% of the world's farmland and are integrated into global supply chains. So we really have to fill that gap. Our policy options, business models and investments have to be sensitive to these differences and we really need to see the green transition affect the business models that are currently not on track. Also recognize that current food systems place a huge and unjust burden on women and young people. We're facing difficult trade-offs between competing objectives that require good faith negotiation amongst communities and actors with different perceptions and interests. And so friends and colleagues in the coming year, um, it really does offer us an opportunity to come together to transform the food systems, reshape land use as a central component of resilient recovery, and the upcoming Food Systems Summit and its key meetings um, and consultations at the local level um, will be real rallying points. We're going to need more partnerships, we're going to need a change in mindsets and a renewed sense of urgency and scale for the collective and ambitious action that's really needed um, to protect people, but also our home, the planet. I really look forward to hearing the ideas of the, plan of, the, um, of the panel, because this is going to inform much of the climate action that takes place in this pivotal year, um, uh, where we need to ensure that Glasgow means that we have changed direction on a course that is going to get us to 1.5 degrees. Thank you very much indeed for that, Deputy Secretary General of the UN, Amina Mohammed, as well. Well, let's move straight on. And uh, already referenced by the Deputy Secretary General uh, was Costa Rica and the efforts that they are making as well. Uh, so I'll go straight to the President of Costa Rica. I, I, and I think the Deputy Secretary General framed it very, very well, far better than I can as well. This isn't just about food. It's about diversity. It's about nature. It's about our climate aspirations as well, sir. 
It is indeed, Steve, and uh, I'm honored to be part of this distinguished um, panel. Uh, for starters, I, I want to point out one key element of the conversation, which is leadership. Uh, and in this, people matter. I mean, in Costa Rica, there is a saying, uh, throughout the year, you think once or twice about the services of a lawyer, once or twice about the services of a physician, but you never tend to think daily on the services of farmers or people that transport food or the processing of food. We have normalized that. It sometimes, for many parts of our communities, is for granted. For many others, it's something that's scarce. They don't have access to that. So one key thing is of leadership is to reboot the conversation. That's why I congratulate the, the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General for the leadership on putting the conversation um, on the table. We need to talk about this and we need to talk it now because it's currently a problem and it's going to be, if we do not take action now, a uh, more severe problem in the future. But as, uh, as in any complicated situations, there are risks, but obviously there are opportunities and we need leadership, need to seize those opportunities and act courageously. Uh, one of the things, uh, and I appreciate the mention by Deputy Secretary General, that we are aiming to, to, to make the balance between climate change, biodiversity, and food production in a healthy and appropriate way is the Ambition Coalition. We launched together with France and many other countries like the UK and Canada to protect 30% of the, of the planet in land and also in the oceans. And let's see the example of the oceans. By protecting 30% of the oceans, this measure permits many of the species that are for human consumption, appropriate reproduction. So there is, we can preserve that, those resources for current uh, generations and also for future generations. Also thinking about the possibilities of uh, cultivating species inland and many other techniques. In that sense, technology is one of our key allies and leadership has to foster new, clean, healthier technologies, more nutritious products, uh, technologies that allow to reduce water consumption and fresh water consumption. That's one of the key problems, for example, in Latin America, wherever we need water for human supply, but also water for, uh, for production. It's been said that sometimes water supply vis-a-vis -vis human consumption and agriculture takes sometimes 10, consumes 10 times more for the production. And we are sometimes just throwing out that uh, scarce resource as well. There are lots of challenges. Even in Costa Rica, we have managed to reverse deforestation and changing a lot the way we used to produce uh, meat. And that helped us to reverse a deforestation that in the 1980s was of 20%. And currently our deforestation, uh, we have uh, forest coverage in the country more than 50%. And we have fixed lots of carbon by doing that. But uh, we have also challenges at the same time. Today, I'm going to sign a, an executive decree, and this is merely a coincidence, but we're going to be signing a new decree for uh, allowing more healthier uh, molecules for agrochemistry and pesticides, because it's been a long problem in Costa Rica with the molecules we have. And that's also a key problem throughout the region of what the products we use on agriculture. But then again, you, if you see, it's very similar to the challenges we are facing. The challenges we're facing today are very linked to complexity. They are interlinked in several fields, in several levels of governance, in the national level, in the local level, in the multilateral level, in a multilateral understood not only as countries, but countries, companies, small firms, small farmers, indigenous people, women, large firms. 
And that complexity needs to be addressed with leadership. We have been facing also uh, the problem of populism, which sometimes just shows the simple solutions, that they are not solutions, they're just uh, discourse, speech. Um, and we need to face that as well, courageously, because if not, we need to tell people why are we doing, why this matters so much, why conservation matters so much, why tackling climate change matters so much. Why is it important, for example, that in the case of Costa Rica, in our decarbonization plan, one of the 10 pillars is changing the way we produce food. For example, we have changed the way we produce coffee, and now we have what we call anama coffee, which is adapted and mitigated for climate change. And we're taking a better price because of the quality and these characteristics on the international market. So it's a win-win situation. Uh, but people need to understand this because as I started saying, we have normalized the conversation and we are fixing kind of a status quo that is not allowing us to move any further. So if I had to strengthen something, leadership, courageous leadership to take action. Sir, that's excellent. Thank you very much indeed. So already uh, from His Excellency and indeed from the Deputy Secretary General, we're hearing about the complexity of the situation, how we need strong leadership as well. And yet, uh, Chu Dong Yu, who is a UN Food and Agricultural uh, Organization as well, um, the DG, of course, um, you are trying to put a framework together, sir. You're trying to put a framework together with, what, 130 plus nations. But we've already heard this is pretty complex and we have very diverse countries and farming systems to deal with. Your role is, is, is very difficult, sir, and convoluted. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Stephen, uh, moderate. I'm a pleased to be uh, here and also uh, join the House Care, the uh, actions to transform agri-food system even agri-food is more complex than you expect than the, the, the pure food system. Improve the lives of farmers in an inclusive and resilient manner by grow, nourish, and sustainable together. As uh, 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 Amelia mentioned several statistical numbers, you also, that's come from the FL uh, uh, flagship uh, publication already. I don't want to repeat it here again. But addressing the future of agro-food systems requires a holistic view covered many topics, such as agriculture production, climate change, uh, and the value chain efficiency, demographic inclusion, con consumer demand, land use, biodiversity, and so on, and the innovation, and also transport the pest and disease and nutrition and health. So we have to act now. And the COVID-19 pandemic, force us to speed up the, the action. More and more million people still going hungry during pandemic. It is sometimes too much of food we produce is lost and wasted. It will be threatened to reverse the progress achieved over the last two decades. If you are, we are here, we see this for crisis, force all the members to step up for the green recovery and the agri-food system transformation. So we, not just initial new uh, uh, strategy frameworks. We will move forward to achieve the SDGs, especially SDG 1, SDG 2, and SDG 10. We will focus on the new strategy based on the new vision for better, better production, better nutrition, better environment, and a better life by hand in hand initiative. You say you're right correctly. We have 194 members, you know, uh, uh, and we have to look beyond one FO. We have to consider the, all the members, uh, they are really have a voice to hear and they, they are interested, we have to offer the service to them. Land is a mother for a human being and a biodiversity. It's a base of the economy, society and the environment and the vital for productivity and sustainable of agri-food systems. So I think innovation on differentiation, use of a different types of land from the fertile land to the semi Dry land combines human creative technology, science, and uh, entrepreneurship. In that sense, we need uh, the private engagement. And also we need a lot of uh, uh, help from the civil society and academy. So we want to build a bigger partnership. That's why the FAO, when I come to the office, we start a hand-in-hand -hand initiative. And that's also we offer the hand-in-hand -hand geospatial data platform, a data lab for statistical innovation, and also SMAP, 
developed together with Google. And that's where we will invite the, provide the members with valuable real-time data that support the strategy decision-making. Digital FO has been established within unprecedented pace. During past years, uh, we now are now fully running on digital with uh, six UN languages simultaneously. So next time, uh, we can offer the uh, service for you if uh, CNBC is willing to work with us uh, globally. Yeah? Um, absolutely. Count me in, sir. Count me in. And, and, and <laughs> you've already said, uh, I'm there. Trust me, uh, it, it's very important to me. But uh, you've already said something quite startling, and I will come back to you with this as well, because everybody, if, if we need a sense of urgency, we've just heard it there. Um, it, not only is the status quo not acceptable, but we are at risk of reversing two decades of progress. I think yeah, that is a I startling said. comment, sir. Startling comment. I will come back to you on this a little bit later on as well. Uh, Viva Dreyer is the chairman of the managing board of Rabo Bank, which I'm told is the largest agricultural bank working in the food uh, and agricultural sector based in the Netherlands. Viva, um, you had a problem a few years ago. Not enough people were in, interested in investing and providing the finance uh, for new, cleaner, greener initiatives, especially in farming. Now, I guess you've got the opposite problem, sir. <laughs> no, no. no. Eva Dreyer? There you go. Can, can you hear me now? Yes. I, I can hear you now, sir. There you go. Thank you for, uh, for that question, because I think we are in a luxurious position as a planet that there is now abundant capital available to be invested. And, uh, and I think the role of finance is now also getting full recognition as a partner of the transition that needs to take place. We can offer... Uh, capital to the required investments from large-scale investment, but also micro-level investments uh, via, via new digital technology. We can also help in categorizing these green loan categories and channeling the financing to green investments so that it becomes transparent, as I think Larry Fink also called for a one standard in his letter last week. Um, but I, I, what I would want to take as an engineer coming into finance, I would like to take the opportunity to explain explain the connection between finance and the transitions that we talked about that are so urgent. Because there are still some conversions needed to get that abundance of capital into where it's now needed, the transitions themselves. And there are three uh, transformations required that I'm, I want to talk about. First, when you talk about basic needs uh, of financing and finance investors, it's the risk return. It is true now that the return of these investments can arguably be made. The return is no longer an issue when it comes to these transitions that we talk about in the food supply chain. The trouble largely is the risk. When farmers shift their practice, it typically takes two or three seasons before they are in the new zone. And that is a risky phase and they're volatile. And I think as, uh, as Excellency uh, so eloquently uh, articulated before is that we really think about the farmer. We need to help and support the farmer to bridge the gap of risk that's one of the conversions that is needed. And partners in the financial sector need to work together to de-risk some of these transitions. The second conversion that is needed is that of duration. Many of the transitions that we talk about have a length of time that a typical bank normally doesn't cope with. So we need connections between banks and institutional investors to get to longer duration times of these transitions. And that is possible. We've done it in the, in the offshore wind arena where you have a building phase and a, and a running phase. And the third transition that I want to talk about is the pricing in of externalities, of, of, of burdens to the planet, of social costs that I think also our, 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 our chairman talked so eloquently about in the beginning. And that can be done. And, I, and on one of the, the externalities is the price of carbon. We've now seen, we're seeing uh, many corporates commit to Paris by voluntary reductions. There is now an abundance of need of this this reduction of CO2 footprint by large corporates in the Western world. And we need to bridge that to, for example, the Costa Ricas of the world and the farmers in Brazil and Argentina and North America. And this is what I want to talk about for just a few minutes. And this is what we call a carbon bank. The world needs a system that connects these demands for, for carbon reduction with where it can actually be done by farmers in Costa Rica by creating new nature projects by farmers in North America and South America. And this transition is what we're building on as Rabobank. And we build an alliance together with the World Economic Forum to create this carbon trading platform where there are agencies involved with the certification of these projects, where there are big companies involved that have a need to reduce 
And there's obviously institutions involved with creating a trading platform that needed this system. I think it's not, it's not an, ur yes, it's urgent, but there's almost a crystallization point, a, a crystallization point. If we trigger that system that I now talked about, this could really accelerate the transition that food goes through. Farmers can benefit significantly from getting a fair reward for their contribution to more sustainable practices. It's substantial. It could double the profit of a farmer if they get a fair reward for the externalities that they help reduce. And that, I think, is, a, is more than an urgent uh, opportunity. It is a crystallization point that we're now about to embark on. And I'm hoping that the Food Summit this year will be the place where we can talk about the dimensions of that new system that will be a crystallization point to accelerate the transition that you talked about. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm, before we um, get to Raman Laguata, I'm just going to say to Agnes, just have a, have a think about what Viva just said. Is that financing there or there's still big gaps as well, of course, uh, in the amount of financing that's getting to some of those smaller players as well. But I do want to get to Raman Laguata first as well. He is, of course, the chairman and chief executive officer of PepsiCo. I've, I've Just a little insight for our, our viewers now. I've already talked to him uh, off camera about the very exciting news that uh, PepsiCo have already done this week, a product, I'm going to say it here, I really like it. It's a non-meat burger and now they're working with them. So I'm very excited about your news there. But uh, you want to go beyond this as well. And, and what I think is fascinating is how much of the food system change is going to be led by companies such as yourself and how much of it is being led by the consumer as well, Ramon? Thank you, Steve. Um, listen, I, I, I think we, uh, the way we're looking at this transformation and building on what everybody else said, I think we have to play uh, on the farmer and we have to play on the consumer. I think those are the two big entities that would really drive the full ecosystem change, right? So there, there's, when you look at the farmer and, and obviously we, we've heard that there is multitude of farmers from very large super scale companies to very small holders that really require different needs and their business model is very different. So we need to solve for all of them um, I, I think there is a uh, there is a need to be local and very granular. So there are solutions cannot be top down. Solutions need to be bottom up. But there's a few ideas that we're testing um, with multiple collaborators. Uh, you know, and many of them across here sitting a, a, around the table that can be investable and scalable. And 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 let me let me tell you a few. In, you know, so that we we can get to the debate. The, the first idea is there. There is a um, there is a need to make the um, the farmer aware of the, uh, the the new techniques and new ways of doing things that you know they're they're out there. They're not landing in their in their particular space. The concept of demonstration farms is proven to be very powerful. So building demonstration farms where we have the new techniques and where uh, you know let's say neighborhood. Uh, farmers go and learn from their peers. That's a huge concept. We have many demonstration farms across the world. That's a, a very powerful concept. Second concept that we're working on with the World Economic Forum and some other colleagues is innovation hubs. Innovation hubs, um, you know, there is a lot of money and a lot of startup, a lot of ingenuity going into fintechs, going into, uh, you know, uh, other, other, uh, other fields there's not enough going into agri-tech. And I think we can play a role, large companies with the public sector as well, uh, to build innovation hubs, to bring technology and innovation closer to the farmer. And uh, I think that's a big idea. We're starting with different parts of the world. We're leading one in Colombia, but you know, there's multiple efforts going in, in other parts. Then to what we've said earlier, there is a financial need and there's a carbon market need. And, and those two are, uh, two ways to enable the transformation for the farmers, make sure that they capitalize on, you know, on, on the potential benefits they can drive to the, to the broader ecosystem and they capture the benefit of it, especially the one around carbon is critical. We need the farms to, be, uh, to deliver higher yield, better use of the land and then sequestration of carbon. And that's an ecosystem that we need to incentivize somehow. I think we need to build a market around that. When you think about the consumer to, towards the other end, and that's a responsibility as well of, you know, the large food companies, but everybody that owns brands and has a consumer impact. Consumers, I think we've done a good job 
uh, over many years, it took us a lot of years to uh, make them aware of the nutritional values of products. And, you know, it took us, and, but you can see more or less in most of the products around the world, you know, good nutritional information. So consumers are, can make their own decisions, their own choices around different parts of the day, different moments. They can make their choices and balance their diets as they, as they prefer to do. There is very little knowledge on environmental footprint of products. I mean, consumers don't really know, and therefore they, they, they don't valorize the environmental footprint of a product. I mean, we were not generating demand towards the, the, uh, the products, the brands, the supply chains that really are more protective of the environment. We need to find a way. We're working on it. There is technology that can help us now understand the sourcing of products, the ingredients, the, uh, the movement of goods across the whole supply chain and therefore the environmental footprint of that product. I think that if we can move consumers through awareness and through product innovation, as you said, some of the things we're doing, but you know, we're doing that with our own portfolio as well, legume snacks, uh, different cereal breakfast, different uh, juice uh, products. We can move demand towards spaces that are good for the consumer, good for the planet. That is a huge idea. Brands play a huge role. Consumer information plays a huge role. And we need to move demand to those spaces, valorize sustainability, sustainable products. And that will generate, as, as President Alvarado was saying, better products, like he was referring to the coffee, uh, you know, better, better products for the planet, better for the consumers, higher prices, better li livelihoods for, for farmers. I think there's an ecosystem that, I'm, I'm positive. I, I, listen, if I, if I wanna send a message, it's a message of optimism. I, I have never seen so many conversations between the public and the private sector in the last uh, six, eight months enabled by you know, the World Economic Forum, but also Mrs. Calabata, thank you for what you're doing with the UN Innovation, uh, U, the UN Summit. I think the five tracks, the leadership you've put in place, the milestones, the clear, uh, the dialogue spaces, that's going to help us to really make a lot of positive traction over the next uh, few months. And I'm very optimistic of what we can do. You've made my job very easy uh, there, Ramon, because I'm going straight to Agnes Calibato, who is a special envoy for UN uh, Food Systems Summit as well. And Agnes, I thought the, the comments I've heard already from our excellent speakers really underlines what you Feel is one of the priorities and that is awareness awareness about these innovations awareness of the financing available awareness of the environmental footprint etc etc as well so a lot of the the obstacles are being overcome or aren't they thank you steve and let me just start by building on what lamon has said and, and thank you, uh, DSG. If I'm doing a good job, it's because I'm standing on someone's shoulders and I, I just don't know how you do it. I just want to say thank you. You're doing so much for all of us. And, and from a Food Systems Summit perspective, we wouldn't have done as much as we've done without the support we are getting from you. So you all need to know that this lady is doing amazing, amazing work. So in, now, going to the Food Systems Summit, um, it was launched uh, that, uh, the year before last with three major objectives. We are behind on SDGs and, and, and the DSG has said it. And despite all our efforts to put our, food, uh, our best foot forward, we are, nutrition is, uh, our, our, what we are doing with nutrition is still creating lots of obesity. And now we, we are actually talking about you know, uh, what is happening there as being a pandemic, a slow pandemic that is underlying the whole COVID pandemic as we know it. Uh, if, in fact, fearing the COVID pandemic, we know that we are behind on hunger. Uh, six years in a row, we've been seeing hunger increasing, but also we know we are impacting climate change. So the, the, the SG was extremely concerned about this and he requested for two things. He said, you do this summit and do two things. You must take it to the people. People must know what is at stake. But like you all have said, people make these decisions. We make, each of us makes three decisions three times a day to eat, and those decisions impact our food systems. So it really must be a people's summit. It really must be about decisions people make. And Ramon has just said, said how people don't understand the environmental footprint. Just think about it. An avocado here to come from Africa to go to Europe must be size 22. Only 10% of avocados produced in Africa make size 22. 
what happens to all the water that goes to producing all the other avocados? So really and educating people and helping them understand how they're impacting the, the, the food system is extremely important. Number two, he wanted this to be a solution summit, meaning we really need to find, to step out of our comfort zone and come up with solutions that are going to help us come through. We've been discussing this the whole week through the GCA that was happening. The imperative to invest in food systems has never been, there's never been a better time. For every dollar we invest in food systems today, will save us six dollars of trying to deal with damage that happens if we don't do the right thing. So I don't know what would be better to do then than we can do now. So we must do what we need to do now. We've put in place uh, five action tracks in terms of responding to his request for solutions. Those five action tracks cut across the five critical areas that impact our food system. And we put in place dialogues at country level in every country. And I'm really grateful that uh, partners have stepped forward and, and, and are funding how these, these countries dialogue. But the basic, the, the basic principle here is countries get an opportunity to define what they are doing and to define the solutions they put forward. People get to discuss these things, indigenous people, communities, farmers, all these people get to discuss in what we are calling independent dialogues. And the solutions are already known. Take the example of Costa Rica. We just had the conversation that is happening around what they are doing for nature and climate change. The example of Colombia, around what they are doing on biodiversity. Or the example of Vietnam and the partnerships they are creating with Grow Asia. But also what you just said, Ramon, what was just launched here, you know, this initiative that was, was just launched here. These are all things we can build on and there's so much more. So the action tracks right now are scouting the environment to come up with those ideas that are already there, that are scalable, that can help us impact, the, the really create a transition in our food system as fast as we can. And we have a whole group of experts in science that are going to be there to tell us that this direction we are taking is actually the direction we should be taking, that we are not creating more problems in the system. So you talked about finance. The solutions are here. We already know what we are doing. We have more money in our system than we know what we know, we, we know to, do, to do with. So the best thing is to put the, that money to good use and transition our food system rather than start paying for damages that result from, from a dysfunctional food system. So there you have it. Fantastic. Agnes Kalibata, thank you very much indeed for that. So many questions. I'm very aware that we officially have about five minutes. I might be able to stretch it to six or seven if I'm very lucky. So briefest answers, if I may, from all of you as well. Uh, I read a Ford's comment. I thought it was extraordinary. It said food system produces more GHG than any other sector, but neglected by policymakers talking about COP21. They were blind to the footprint of food. Uh, I'm taking it with COP26 this year uh, and with the food system summit this year. That is a thing of the past, uh, not of the present or the future. Let's start off with His Excellency, uh, the President of Costa Rica. Do you believe that policymakers are still blind as they've been accused of being back in uh, COP21, which I was at in 2015? Well, I do believe that's, that's what uh, we are trying to change actually with spaces and debates like this and with the summit that the Secretary General is inviting. Uh, that, I, that is what we need to change now and put it in the conversation of climate change and put it in the conversation of biodiversity, I briefly want to link and build upon uh, two things mentioned, one by Amina Mohammed and another by, by Bieve. And I'll put it in three words. Risk, farmers, subsidies. And I, think, I believe that's one of the key bottlenecks. For example, Central America, this year was hit by two hurricanes, the whole of Central America. Many farmers lost everything. And last year, the 2019, previous year, Central America was hit by uh, the Nina phenomenon, which is drought. So you had drought one year, the next year you had hurricanes and lots of humidity and rain. And then you go to the bank expecting to have some money or loans and they say you're too risky we're not going to lend you or we're going to lend you very high uh, interest rates and on the other hand and i'll be try to be brief but i think, think this is a key part of the conversation on the other hand they say okay you're too risky let's let's import whatever we need 
Uh, but then what happens with the livelihoods in the rural communities and women and indigenous people? And I think also COVID-19 changed that conversation. Why? Particularly at the beginning of the pandemic, because at the beginning of the, pandem the pandemic, when the global chains of logistics were closed, what was the first thing that happened to people, to their decisions? Everybody went to the supermarket, to the marketplace, started buying food or putting it. Uh, it so people reminded themselves the importance of food security locally. But if we don't fix how we finance, how we take risks for farmers, not only thinking of the financial impact, but of the global impact. And if we do not take the conversation of subsidies to a level, for example, of trade, international trade or world trade organization, vis-a-vis -vis climate change as well, we're not necessarily going to fix this. Sir. So I think that, com that is a conversation we need to have. Oh, and I would love to do it over the next two hours, but I've got about three or four sorry minutes. For but... no, no, so no, 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 no. There is nothing that has been said. That's the point that I don't want to expand upon. This is my problem. I've got a one hour show and I've got to go longer. Aviva Dreyer, do you want to just um, uh, comment on that, reply to that as well? That's the problem with financiers, isn't it? There's loads of money sloshing around now, but they have a very different attitude to risk. You said that we need new models, transformative models uh, of how we risk assess these uh, situations and lending to farmers across the world. Um, we you haven't got your mic at the moment, sir. Could we have the mic? There you go. And Good, we're there, sir. Thanks for that summary. And I think you're right, but the, 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 the majority of the money is still stuck in buckets that can't be met to the needs of the farmers' profiles and the risk that they have. And so I think the, the, the real need is that governments and government agencies think about de-risking as the investors get an access to investing. Subsidies tend to be disruptive for, for flow. What I wanted to say in, in one sentence only in this close is, I think it's now time that the finance community becomes part of that solution and not as typically referred to as when it gets difficult, they're part of a problem. I think that is possible, but we need to sit at the table while we design these new systems for carbon trading, while we design the new risk systems to de-risk, and while we design the new systems to match the optimal duration of finance so that it actually can flow. The money is there, we need to map it on the need of the transformations, and it is possible. Thank you very much indeed for being brief there. I've got a hard rap for two minutes, everybody. I've got a hard rap. Chu Dong Yu, I'll come to you in a moment on your your concerns about uh, regressing as well. But on that front, uh, Ramon, um, we're not going to regress in corporate world, are we? Regardless of the administration, regardless of, of who is leading, regardless of, 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 the, of the faddish attitudes of some uh, corporates as well, we're, we're moving in one direction now. I mean, it's irreversible, isn't it, sir? Yeah. I, I think the train has left the station and, and uh, there's, I see more and more CEOs um, uh, driving this change from two dimensions. One is personal values. I think there's a lot of us and I feel obviously very, very close uh, to, to that, to this transition from my values point of view. But also if you think about a business case, risk management of your company, if we want to maximize the value of our companies. 15 years from now, we better include uh, climate risk and some of these other threats into our um, the way we run our companies and we change the model. So I think that is clearly, and you can see this in the commitments that we're all making externally and how we're operation, making this operational in, in our capital allocation, in the capabilities we're building, in our relationship with our farmers and consumers and customers. So I think that full ecosystem is moving you, you see board of directors talking about it. You see investors starting to uh, make our, the companies much more accountable on their ESG commitments. So mm -hmm. I, I think the full ecosystem is, is moving. And that's what I said earlier. I, I'm positive, optimistic that the trend has left, left this station, that now when the private sector takes ownership of this transition, I think we're going to see much more movement, right? We tend to be uh, entities that make things happen, make things happen efficiently, and with very clear commitments and productivity targets. So I think, I think it, it is positive that public and private sector are really talking. There is more trust, I think, between these two uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, units. And I think in, in this combination will we'll drive success. So uh, I, I, see, I see optimism. Chudong Yu, thank you, Ramon. Yeah. Uh, Chudong Yu, final word to you. Uh, everything you've heard, it 
surely, surely, sir, you don't think we're going to reverse two decades of progress. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, uh, um, I was Sandis, though. I, I listened to the president and also the Ramon huh? and the others. Solution. We need the driving force. Driving force come to consumers. And when the people climbing the mountain, we have four forces to move the direction. And then the bridge is a digital, digital approach. Innovation of the policy, innovation of the business model, innovation of technology. So I wanted to take the Costa Rica as a champion. If you start with the innovation of policy, innovation of the business model by digital. And then let's reverse the, uh, all the business of the transformation and growth system from the consumers down to the uh, uh, farmers. Thank you. Sir, thank you very much indeed. Look, um, I didn't know if I was going to come out of this panel worried about the urgency, worried about where we were, or excited by the opportunity. The answer is very clear to me. I am stunningly excited by the opportunity. Thank you so much for... Wow, just great contributions and a great education. May I just thank you all in no particular order. Um, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Amina Mohammed, thank you very much indeed for kicking off the off as well. Uh, Agnes Kalibata, who's the Special Envoy for UN Food Systems Summit. We're with you all the way on this one as well. Raymond Laguata, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of PepsiCo. Uh, I'm very excited about the new ventures as well and where we're going with this as well. Viva Dreyer, Chairman of the Managing Board of Rabobank. Financiers can change for the future. I know they can. Uh, and His Excellency, Carlos Alvarado, Queseda, who's the president of Costa Rica. Thank you, sir. Your, your country is a model of what we should do. Uh, and Chu Dong Yu, uh, the director general of the UN uh, Food and Agricultural Organization. Count me in, sir. Anything you need. Thank you yeah, all very much you, indeed. Thank you. Let's, let's make a digital world. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.